Welcome to Bicom's weekly Huddyum podcast. I'm James Serene, Bicom CEO, and delighted to be joined by our fantastic team in Israel, Richard Pater and Kalev Bendor. Uh, good afternoon, gentlemen. Good afternoon. So we this week are trying to unpick sort of two quite complex issues. We're going to talk a little bit about UK shuttle diplomacy in the Middle East and whether Britain is back in terms of trying to get things done in the Middle East. But also we need to understand what happened over the last few days in Israeli politics, that there was a, all the momentum seemed to be driving forward to an imminent election. And now the election has been postponed. So we will come to that later. But first of all, I, I think we wanted to discuss what's been happening with Jeremy Hunt, our new foreign secretary in the UK. Yes, well, James, if I, if I may ask you, um, we've been watching it from, uh, from Israel, but you may have a better understanding. So we've seen Jeremy Hunt in the region this week, both visiting Riyadh and Tehran, um, obviously two sides opposing the issues within, within Yemen. And I wondered if you could just share your thoughts on what you think about that shuttle diplomacy and, uh, and the UK role in the region. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll do a shameless plug for a Bicom publication that's coming out next week, which is uh, going to be a uh, major review of UK Middle East strategy after Brexit. And, and so we in Bicom uh, have been examining the full extent of UK Middle East strategy and what are the different interests and capabilities that the UK has. And I think with that particular lens, it's been very interesting to see that the Foreign Secretary uh, was in Riyadh, as you mentioned last week, where he, he took some pretty tough messages to um, Saudi Arabian rulers about the Khashoggi murder. And he was very clear about that. He also took with him a uh, potential plan for a ceasefire in, in Yemen. And then just this week, um, he, he went to Tehran, where he he also took some very tough messages and demands about the um, imprisonment of um, British nationals in Iran, most notably um, and high profile, the um, lady who works for the Thomson Reuters Foundation, Nazani Nagari Ratcliffe, who's been in prison for a long time on charges of spying. And he said that, you know, these people should be released and they should not be held hostages in this way. Um, he was very, very clear about that. But at the same time, he was also trying to um, encourage the Iranians to stay in the nuclear deal and to say that the EU was setting up um, this financial mechanism to allow EU companies to trade with Iran. And I was very struck by this situation where um, with uh, US diplomacy, uh, how should we put it kindly, is, is, in, is in a curious place in terms of who are the lead uh, US diplomats. There's a real absence of US ambassadors in crucial countries in the region. And uh, th there is a real issue with you know, US diplomatic leadership in the region. And I think Jeremy Hunt played quite an interesting role being able both to go to Saudi Arabia and to Tehran to deliver these very tough messages to make demands, but for it to sort of pass under the radar, it wasn't particularly controversial. And uh, certainly his hosts did not complain. And uh, I think that would be me perhaps talking about the return of British influence in the region and maybe the start of a more um, a more concrete and substantive role uh, as Britain moves to leave the European Union. But then we have this absolutely bizarre case that you would have seen in the headlines of this British academic, Matthew Hedges, um, being sentenced to life imprisonment in, in the UAE this week. Sure, James, I was going to ask you about the arrest of this student in the United Arab Emirates. I mean, from our understanding here, the UK are quite close allies with the UAE. How do you interpret this move? Well, everyone here is really trying to understand exactly what's happening. It's taken, as I understand it, the British diplomats by surprise. Um, we're talking about a doctoral student who was doing work on civil military relations in the United Arab Emirates. He'd been to the UAE before many times. I think he'd been there since, since childhood a number of times, so he knew the country really well. Um, and he was doing this research and uh, he, he was arrested. And, and, and as I understand it, there was the, a thought that, you know, he would be maybe deported, but led off with a warning and, and that would be that. But it appears to have been quite severely misjudged by the relevant officials. And uh, he was sentenced to life imprisonment this week. And there's a lot of people now kind of trying to interpret 
what on earth this means and indeed trying to reacquaint themselves with the sort of curious politics of the UAE. And I think on the one hand, there's a perception in the UK that the UAE is just another one of these Gulf allies that the UK has, where we have very strong intelligence and security cooperation and, and we have overlapping interests as regards to sort of fighting jihadi terrorism and, uh, you know, trying to check Iran's expansion in the region. And there are British bases in the country and there's a lot of British military cooperation. And there's a huge amount of trade and investment, certainly from the UAE in the UK. It's a very, very, very significant amount. But, you know, as the sort of UAE experts will say, the UAE is a very, very bizarre country. It's a set of absolute monarchies. There is a veneer, like an overcoat, I, I suppose, of modernity in terms of technology and industry and commerce. And there is some elements of uh, socially liberal policies that allow a certain sector of the population um, to live a reasonably socially liberal lifestyle in some senses, but it's also a deeply religious country. Uh, and beneath that top coat, there is a very, very, very traditional society and a very, very closed um, extremely cautious security state where there is no dissent and uh, anyone who looks anything like close to being a threat will be dealt with very, very severely. Um, and so that's really the dilemma here. And, and I think it's hard to understand what's exactly happened, but it is a it is a curious country and it's something that I think, you know, really takes a much harder look. But certainly in terms of the alliance between Britain and the UAE, um, the, the UAE, some of the most capable armed forces in the region, they were very significant in Libya, um, fighting alongside the British and the French, um, they're very significant in Yemen. And I, I think really we're at a moment where a, a UK-UAE alliance is looking very shaky. And the Foreign Secretary Jeremy Hunt's been threatening very severe consequences if this issue is not resolved very, very soon. So that that's kind of really where we are. But I think we should move on to um, to Israeli elections and what happened this week. And, and I was watching at the end of last week, we thought that the country was moving very fast towards elections. And uh, what it looked like was that Prime Minister Netanyahu just sort of outmaneuvered his rivals. They were all giving him ultimatums that they were going to leave the coalition. Uh, he gives this speech about don't break up a right wing coalition at a time of very fragile security where the country is, you know, almost on the verge of war. And uh, then on Monday morning, you know, Naftali Bennett then withdraws his ultimatum and the government's all solid again, but with a weak majority. I mean, how, how did you guys read that? Well, first, I think it's worth kind of reflecting for a moment just on those events that pass through the from the evening, from when the uh, um, Minister Bennett, the chairman of the Jewish Home, and his colleague, Ayelet Shaked, the justice minister, made an announcement that they were holding a press conference the, the following morning. And everyone presumed, and I think cor correctly at the time, that this was going to be the announcement that they were withdrawing their support from the from the government, and that would have uh, would have basically brought on early elections, unless the uh, prime minister would have found another party to bring in uh, into the coalition. But as you said, they were they surprised everyone by making a rather meek announcement and uh, and backing down and, and just talking about the uh, the strength and the responsibility of staying in. What transpired was that there was a couple of uh, conversations between a couple of prominent rabbis um, overnight that uh, that may have well have, have changed uh, um, Naftali Bennett's decision. Of course, he represents the Jewish home, which has the backing of the national religious rabbis, and two particularly prominent rabbis, uh, one rabbi, Rabbi Druckmann, who uh, just so happens to live in the same community as uh, as the prime minister's national security advisor, paid him a visit late at night. They, are, they, are, they know each other, they have... Uh, I believe the rabbi's grandson is married to his to uh, to the national security advisor's daughter, so they they are related through uh, through marriage. And he made the case that uh, that he shouldn't that he should persuade Bennett not to resign because of national security issues. And he was persuaded by information that was not in the public domain to uh, to make that call to to Bennett. In parallel, uh, the prime minister used a, used a second conduit who also had a close connection, his uh, social media advisor, who's a former student in the yeshivat of uh, Haaretzion, who called up his the ped rabbi, ra Rabbi uh, Yaakov Maidan, and made a similar plea to him to also uh, insert himself into this story and persuade that it was the, the, the national responsible thing to do for, uh, for Naftali Bennett to stay in the government, which is what in fact transpired. Question on the first rabbi, obviously the national security advisor was sent on this mission purely. He has a, a, a solely security remit and is not meant to involve himself in politics. 
So the claim is that he did make this case on the grounds of national security. But for some, it looks very, uh, very odd and suspicious that he is making this intervention into what is also perceived as a very much a political affair. So, so on from there, um, the, the Knesset came together and we had two days of voting, both on Tuesday and Wednesday. On Tuesday, it was a much more difficult day for the government. They lost a vote on a, on a piece of, of a bill talking about land reform. They learned their lesson. And on, and on yesterday and Wednesday, they much kept, were much more careful to carefully whip the, uh, the coalition that all the bills then passed in their favour. And in fact, the opposition withdrew. They, they thought they had the whip hand. Um, the day before, they actually withdrew for no confidence measures because they realised they were going to get voted down. And so the government remains. And I think the, the assessment here is that they will survive from, from Wednesday to Wednesday. The Tuesday and Wednesday are kind of the main votes that we will have that same pressure now on a weekly basis going on, that they make sure they need to keep uh, keep the discipline tight and make sure they can, they keep a, a constant majority in the house so they don't have a uh, they don't lose any more votes so i mean any government operating under under those kind of conditions it, it just means it's very very tight they can't go on trips abroad they they can't sort of travel where they want around the country and it sort of ties them to the Knesset and you have these kind of scenes that we had this week where prime minister Netanyahu was was pictured uh, in the cafe at the Knesset and Sharon Haskell was, was leaving hospital to, 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 to vote. But aside from the inconvenience, essentially, as you, as you sort of say, that the government, certainly for the time being, can, can carry on, but it will just take one major disagreement to potentially break it up. But then anyone who then does break it up then bears that responsibility. And Prime Minister Netanyahu this week did a very good job of placing that kind of pressure on the Jewish Home Party and saying, you know, you don't want to be the one that breaks this government up. But how long do you think that kind of pressure can be effective? Well, I think, I think as, as we said, the, the government, um, I think you know, Netanyahu definitely did outmaneuver um, the Jewish home. But despite that, I think it's, it's clear that the government's days uh, are numbered. Um, there, there's only so long they can continue to go on 6159. Um, the head of Kulano, who's part of the coalition, Moshe Kachlon, said he won't leave the coalition, but he doesn't think that it's healthy being in such a, a small majority. So I think there's no doubt that certainly before November, which is when elections need to happen, November 2019, there will almost certainly be elections. But in some ways, maybe it doesn't really matter. I think there's, there's a big issue here of, in some ways, who initiates the elections. And had we spoken last week, we would have said that, that it was Lieberman. It was a big Lieberman from, from uh, Yisrael Beitenu. And now, however it falls apart, Netanyahu has got an opportunity for him to initiate. And I think that's very much what he wants. And a lot of the discussion here was that Netanyahu doesn't want a March election, uh, but a May election uh, would suit him quite well. It would allow him to go to APAC, to give a speech, to look very state uh, statesmanlike. It would allow him to preside over uh, Yom Ha'atzma'ut and Yom Ha'zikaron. Uh, and it would also, on the assumption there's, there's not another flare-up, it would also give uh, the opportunity to push further away the memory of uh, the recent Gaza episode, which a lot of Israelis and certainly a lot of Likud voters uh, were very disappointed with the result. So even if there are early elections, I think the amount of time that Netanyahu will uh, save by delaying will serve him well. So potentially things carry on until maybe February, then the election campaign begins and you, you have that election in May. But it's an interesting point you make about being able to preside over all those major national celebrations that take place in that season of sort of April that, that, that allows him to sort of preside over them and, uh, and, and benefit from that. So we don't see any major crises that will break the government up in the next three months, even though we've got this conscription bill that needs to be solved and we've got this uh, culture bill. But we, we think that, that those will generally be OK. Well, I mean, maybe uh, maybe, we'll, maybe we'll disagree here. I'd be surprised if uh, if the government's still lasting on, on the 1st of January 2019. Um, I, I genuinely don't see how it can continue for, for, for the next month or two. Um, but 
again, for Netanyahu, I'm not sure how, mu how much it matters. Um, and when the Knesset does decide to dissolve itself, uh, at that stage, they will then choose a date that is anything between three to five months after, after the dissolution. So I personally, um, let me put it this way, had we spoken last week, I would have said we, we'd already been in election season, so I could, I could easily be wrong. But I personally don't think the government will uh, survive for the next month or two. But as long as, from Netanyahu's perspective, as long as he can initiate um, the dissolution of the Knesset, uh, I'm not sure how bothered he'll be. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. And certainly last week it looked like Prime Minister Netanyahu resembled a leader who was being dragged into a situation that he wasn't in control of. He definitely did a, a pretty good job of wrestling back control and, and making it look like he's the one setting the terms. And, and he came out of this ultimatum that he needed to appoint Naftali Bennett as defence minister. There were some pundits saying, well, he might compromise and uh, appoint him as a foreign minister, but it's totally untenable that he'll stay foreign minister and defence minister and prime minister. And then lo and behold, here we are a week later, he's still doing all three jobs. He hasn't offered any of the, the, those jobs to anybody else, any other party. And there were rumours that he might even promote a Likud minister and he hasn't even done that yet. So he's come out of it uh, you know, intact, and uh, he's still got the the potential sort of prizes to give out if he needs to. So I mean, that that's a that's a pretty good week. But I I I, uh, I definitely concur with what you're saying that it's an it's an unstable situation. You know, at that kind of wafer thin majority, it's 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 very shaky, and it, it does mean that the government is a uh, is not functioning at full capacity. I would definitely agree with that. You mentioned the uh, the the foreign, the foreign ministry. I mean, in particular, I mean, it seems like. The Prime Minister is holding the Defence Ministry um, ministerialship for the first time. Um, he chaired a, his, his first meeting as, uh, as formerly Defence Minister today and made the announcement of appointing Ayal Zamir as the new uh, Deputy Chief of Staff. Um, the question is, is the, as kind of conventional wisdom suggests, it's untenable that he holds all three positions in the long term. And perhaps in the next week or two, we will see a, uh, a new Foreign Minister. The problem is, is that uh, there are so many could, uh, current ministers that, that, are, that fancy an upgrade and see themselves as prospective uh, foreign ministers. Whoever doesn't get it is going to then bear a, bear a grudge and becomes, a, becomes an enemy from within as well. So it's a tricky job that he has to select the appropriate candidate. Well, gentlemen, I think we will leave it there, but we've covered a lot of ground. Um, thank you very much for being with us. And uh, for our listeners, just remind you that if you haven't already, please do review our podcast on iTunes and please listen again next week. Thank you very much. Thank you.